The lathe is a bit of a handful to spin around on the workbench, so I'll try to take care of everything that attaches to the back first. That means hanging the motor. It's just a junked motor that was on the lathe when I got it. I'm not going to invest time into refurbishing a rattly old Chinese motor, but it works, so I may as well keep using it until it pops. I did give it a quick spray to clean it up, but that's all. At first I installed the motor base plate in the wrong position. It looks as though the hinge part of the plate is notched to fit inside the countershaft bracket, but in fact it doesn't. Did you guys really think I would go to all this effort without replacing the broken back gears? There are a couple of places on the lathe that take these flat top grub screws, designed to allow rotation. The brass plate on the switch is held with two little hammer drive screws. Well, they're more like pins with a very steep spiral cut. Next up is the countershaft mechanism. It's a pretty straightforward reassembly job, but I managed to find a way to take it on and off about five times. The small black collar has no business being installed here. And also this shaft is better installed second, after the countershaft tensioner. There are two screws that rest on the cutouts on the tensioner shaft. They raise or lower the countershaft, releasing and applying tension to the belt drive. For some brain fade reason, I put the jam nuts on the underside, which made it impossible to loosen the belt enough. To be fair, my confusion was compounded by the fact that the new belt was way too small. After swapping belts about three times, I had the forehead slap moment. And then, with the correct size belt and the jam nuts in the correct position, everything went together perfectly. The belt swapping was just through my local auto parts store, so no big drama. I figure it's about time this chunk of useless metal becomes a lathe again, so next up, installing the headstock. I'm oiling the bed of the lathe, wiping nearly all of the oil off, and then checking for any grit with my bare hand. And same with the underside of the headstock. There is no adjustment available for the alignment of the headstock. Alignment relies purely on the accuracy of the mating surfaces.
There are two screws in the front face of the bed that pass through and clamp the headstock rearwards against the inside of the bed. I tighten these after snugging up the four main headstock set screws. While the spindle is still easily accessible, I'll swap out the old back gear. You've seen all of this before, so I'll work fast. I don't think the amount of end float on the new back gear is really acceptable. The gear is made narrower than the original. It's not actually a problem, but does feel a bit amateur. Time for the bull gear. I can't be bothered pulling everything off the spindle again, so I'm just going to mash the new bull gear into place. Sweet. But here is a little problem that could have caused carnage. The set screw that secures the little selector tooth peg is too long and protrudes far enough to strike the gears below. It's the same thread as the screw in my old back gear so I swapped it without drama. Bad luck though if anyone starts their lathe without noticing. Next up, installing the counter shaft. I reamed the bushings from one side right through, but it's still a little tight going between the two halves, so a few light taps are required. It helps to remember to hook the belt over first. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm just figuring out that I may have put the jam nuts on the wrong side. A fibre thrust washer and the main pulley go onto the outside of the counter shaft. This is not a mistake, I realise that they have to come off to fit the belt guard. <coughs> This is a little point of interest. The belt guard is different from every other ML7 picture I've seen. It looks more like the guard on a Super 7. I guess they had some Super 7 parts left over. The cover uses a pinch hinge arrangement, a turned screw facing upwards on the lower hinge and this one facing downwards at the top. Both the stiffness of the door and its alignment are easily set.
Two plates bolt to the underside of the saddle casting and act like clamps. They stop the saddle from lifting vertically off the lathe bed. Normally shims are inserted between the saddle plates and the casting so that the plates slide just clear of the underside of the lathe bed. In this case, because the underside of the saddle has been skimmed, the space between the saddle and the plates has increased. It happens to work out as near as perfect that the front guide doesn't need adjustment either way. Because the rear guide is a bit more worn, the gap between the guide and the underside of the saddle is actually too large, so I'll have to add a sheet of brass to the guide and then shim to achieve clearance. I didn't film it because it all happens out of view, but basically I messed about inserting the right combination of shims under each bolt until the rear plate slid without friction along the underside of the bed. This small black plate secures this crusty old piece of felt. I wasn't keen to convert any more of my hard-earned dollars into MyFit parts, so I cut a new piece from some felt I already had. It was thinner, so I needed more layers, but it works fine. And this is it, the final piece of the puzzle. Thanks for watching. I enjoy bringing cracked out old things back to usefulness. This time I decided to record the process and stick the videos on YouTube. The response has been awesome. Thank you to all of you guys who watch the videos, especially those who comment and subscribe. 
I think we're at about 460 subscribers right now, which I know is trivial in the big YouTube world, but I think it's amazing that there are 460 real people out there that have taken a keen interest in this project. It's been fun, so I guess I'll keep going. I've got a few small restoration projects to deal with. The next machine restoration is ready to start. And I'm thinking about something a bit more exciting. And of course, there's always the elephant in the room.